with an eight-year-old kid in an after-school program, or would rather go and play golf with a special weapon than to go down another red carpet of a movie premiere. Because to me, it was so important to give something back, and eventually, the joy of giving became so huge for me that I was literally turning away from my movie career. And I made a decision to run for governor of California. I remember when I finished promoting Terminator 3, there was the race, always said the governor's race in California. I jumped in there, and I tell you that even though everyone said to me, says, I don't feel crazy, don't do that, not only did they think that I would not make it, but there were all my friends that said, you're insane because you're going to lose all this money. I don't you make 20, 30 million dollars a movie, you're going to lose all of that when you become governor. They're going to pay you $187,000 yearly salary. That's it. And all those hundreds of millions of dollars you're going to lose. But I said, I don't care. Because I knew that I was at this level of success because of America. So therefore, it was time to give something back to America. And I can tell you that those seven years were the most exciting, and the most rewarding, and the most gratifying years of my life. I mean, to work all day and to solve problems and to serve the people was absolute heaven. It was the best job that I've ever had. And I remember that even though when it came to an end, the two terms came to an end because of the term limits, I knew that my job would come to an end, but my interest in serving the people never would come to an end. And this is why I continued with after-school programs, that's why I continued with my fitness crusade, that's why I continued with all the different programs with Special Olympics, including starting a Schwarzenegger Institute at the University of Southern California to continue to inspire students and leaders around the world to find solutions to complicated issues and to give back and to make the world a better place. So to me, this was extremely important. And I was always inspired by heroes that made a difference in the world. I mentioned two, Muhammad Ali and Sergeant Shriver, but there's others, like Nelson Mandela, Ronald Reagan, Miguel Gorbachev, or leaders like Father Teresa, or Chancellor Paul, or Churchill, and people like that. There's a whole list of people like that. Those people had such an unbelievable and profound impact on the world. And I tell you something that when you take the life, for instance, of a former judge, just to take one, I mean, every time I meet this man, I'm in awe. Because here's a guy that rose from the bottom of the ranks and from the communists and straight up to the top. And then when he was at the top, he became the president of the Soviet Union, he became one of the most powerful people in the world, and he became the head of the Communist Party. He looked around and he realized that the system doesn't work. I mean, think about that. You realize that communism didn't work. So what do you do when you're at the head of the Communist Party and you realize that the system doesn't work? I mean, it's a dilemma, isn't it? But he, you know what he did? He started dismantling communism step by step. Think about the guts that it takes, the courage that it takes. I mean, Gorbachev has transformed his country with glass nose by giving his people for the first time freedom and with perestroika by reforming Russia's economy. He didn't wait for another president to do it. He didn't say, oh, this is terrible, the situation here. I don't know what to do about it and complain much. No, he said, if not me, who? And if not now, when? So what I'm saying is, is all of us need to embrace that kind of a spirit. We want to go and change the world. All of us need to create change, whether it is our neighborhoods, our schools, or our country. And I'm not talking as big as Gorbachev, I'm talking about just even something little. Each and every one of you can go out and reach out and help some kid read that is difficult in reading, or with math, or with something, or with some sports program, or be a coach in a local uh, uh, sports uh, program of some sort. Or you can do something also big. What I'm saying here is, is let's not work only on me, but let's work also on we. That is the important thing. Because to lead a truly poor life, you must give back. You must leave the world a better place than we found it. So those, ladies and gentlemen, and my bodybuilding and fitness friends, those are my rules. 
the rules of success. And I guarantee you that if you follow all of those rules, then you will be able to celebrate many, many victories. And you will leave your mark. And you will have a great legacy that you can be proud of. So remember again the rules. Have a vision. Think big. Ignore the naysayers. Work your ass off. And give back and change the world. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you very much. Thank you. Extremely nervous, and now I'm meeting you for the first time. You know, everyone, everyone loves Barney, mate. So, the first question is how do I address you? Do I call you the governor? Do I call you Mr. Schwarzenegger? Do I call you the Terminator? Do I call you Barney? What's the best thing to address you as, mate? Well, first of all, it depends where you go. I mean, here you can call me Arnie, or you can call me Schnitzel, or you can call me Arnie. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a difference. Uh, if I go to the University of Southern California, or do I any university, they call me professor because I'm also if I go somewhere for work again, then they call me governor. Uh, if I go to a movie premiere, then they call me the Terminator, or the, the Predator Killer, or whatever it is, or, or twins. So it, it really is. It makes no difference, because I'm not at all hooked to uh, this kind of titles. Uh, to me, I think that we all are the same. Uh, I struggle in the gym, you guys all struggle in the gym, you struggle in the gym. We're all on the same level. This is what I love about gyms because it puts everyone on the same level, no matter how much money you have, or how old you are, or if you're a woman or a man or whatever, everyone is equal with this. The 200 pounds on the bench feel exactly the same way for everybody. It's a heavy weight. And everyone is struggling with the weights, and that's what I love about it. So I think everyone here is the same. Yeah, great answer. I want to take the opportunity now to get away with this once, with all respect, and I want to call you Schnitzel. <laughs> Uh, what's, what's been your, what's the, what's the most favourite movie you've made, whether it's been the most successful or what's been your favourite movie that you've made? Uh, it's very hard for me to say what the favourite is because there were movies that I have made that were a tremendous amount of struggle. Uh, like when you do the Terminator movies or True Lies. Uh, predators, a lot of night shooting, there's a lot of stunts to be done, discomfort where you put yourself in the mud and, 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 and you have to stop you uh, all night long and you freeze your butt off uh, and, and all of this. So, but when you see the finished product, when you see the finished movie, then you say, wow, this really came out great, so I really like this movie. So, it, it, there's a lot of struggle, but the end result is great. On the other hand, when you do a movie like Twins, you have a great time with Danny DeVito. You, you only film like two months or three months, and you uh, drink your cappuccinos, and you know, because he likes to cook, he makes pasta, and you have a good time, you have to do your jokes, you do your scenes, and all of those things, smoke the stogie. So, it's, uh, and, and the result also is great. So it really depends. I mean, if you look at the making of the movie, I'd rather do comedies when it comes to the making of the movie. But the result, of action movies, they of course became the highest uh, grossing movies, the, the Terminators and True Lies and all those movies. So that's why it's very hard to say what is my favorite. I've done a bunch of good movies, I was very fortunate that I have been part of a lot of good movies, very successful movies. And then again at the same time I have also made movies that went right into the toilet. So it's, it's, it's what I talked about earlier, you know, that no one is there that has just successes. He always says failures too. And the important thing is that we learn from the successes and that we learn also from our failures. Alright then. Uh, I reckon a lot of people would want to ask me this question. And I've got my favourite. My favourite's from, uh, there's a whole, the, the movie's littered with them from Commando, those, those clangers, did you call that? <laughs> my favourite's from on the plane, and you sit next to that guy, and they've kidnapped you, and they take you away, you lean down, and you elbow on the head, knock him out, and you just quickly lean over and crack his neck and kill him. <laughs> Rest him up on the pillow, put the other thing over him, just, <laughs> like he's dead. 
and you call the hostess and the hostess comes over and you don't disturb my friend, he is dead tired. <laughs> What's, what's, been, what's been the standout thing like is literally, you've got, you've got millions of YouTube channels dedicated to, to the lines you brought out, mate, they're amazing. What's been your favourite? Go to the chopper! <laughs> Don't drink and bake. <laughs> well, you know, nailing the guy with the long knife through the chest, boom, and then say, stick around. <laughs> so, things like, you know, this, but also, of course, you know, the, I'll be back. <laughs> or, hasta la vista, baby. And then, you know, killing the T-1000. So, so, and and there was a lot of, uh, you know, great lines like that. What's interesting about it is, is that you never know when you say the line in a movie that that's going to be the line that is becoming famous or that people like. You have no idea. When I did the, the I'll be back line, we had no idea. We argued, as a matter of fact, the director and I, and we argued about how to deliver that line because I always said, I will be back. <laughs> and he says, no, no, I wrote, I'll be back. And I said, but it sounds better to me, I will be back. And he says, I don't, I don't tell you how to act, so don't tell me how to write. <laughs> Just say the line, I'll be back. And I said, but it sounds weird, this aisle, this whole, you know, so I just find it's weird. And he says, do it. <laughs> so we did it like 10 different takes. And then one, you know, worked. And so that's how this, uh, but I had no idea that, that, that when the movie came out, and the line became so famous, I remember that as soon as the movie came out, people came up to me and they said, uh, I was in New York, and someone came running up to me and says, I don't say the line, say the line. I said, what line? He says, you know, in a movie, in Germany, the, the I'll be back line. I say, I'll be back. He said, no, 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 say it the way you say it in the movies. And I said, I'll be back. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, do that away. It's a special line to be the line. So you never go ahead of time. Uh, legend let off some steam, man. <laughs> uh, Ani, from, uh, from obviously you know, a young kid in Austria of all places, to what you've achieved is more than probably the most uh, highest achieving human beings in the world are ever going to achieve. You're one of the highest achievers in so many fields. It's just incredible. I want to list all the things you've achieved. And I was going to ask you, you know, a very poignant question, a very heavy question about, you know, all the, you know, how did you get here, or did you believe this, or did you dream this, and you answered them all, you said it all, it's just, there's no questions that need to be asked, you kind of covered everything that could be asked. But, politics, did you, when you were, you know, a 15 year old kid in, in Austria, and you had that dream, that massive dream of coming to America, did you think you'd, you'd one day be the governor of one of the, the biggest economies in the world, it's just, it's just phenomenal. No, I mean, I had absolutely no interest in politics when I was at that age, the only thing I wanted to do is, uh, to be the most muscular man and to be a powerlifting champion and a weightlifting champion and to get into movies and all the things that I talked about. You know, that was my dream, to be another Reg Park. Um, but as you get older, then all of a sudden other things become more, uh, you know, important to you. And so as my career I started evolving and I started, uh, you know, still making a lot of money and I started uh, getting really uh, successful in movies and in business as an entrepreneur and so whatever you know happened around me i felt like this is really the land of opportunity i mean this is amazing the kind of things that you can accomplish in america and i was just so i mean so taken back by you know we hear so many times about america is the land of opportunity and it's kind of a line but i mean then to experience it uh, that through hard work, if you're really struggling, if you really work hard, that you can do it. That there's no one there holding you back. That I all of a sudden started feeling that I should give something back. And that feeling started getting bigger and bigger. And then it evolved over a period of like 15 years uh, to the time where I just felt like, well, I should just, you know, give up my movie career. I should just jump in. I think that I have of what it takes to lead California during those very difficult circumstances. And we had the recession, the job losses, and all of those things, the power of politicians couldn't get along. So I felt like I should jump in and that I should do it. I should just not just sit in front of the TV like people do all the time and say, oh, these are terrible, those politicians. 
they are not to be trusted. Oh, I'm not going to go out and vote this time. In order to say, but they don't do anything about it. People just complain, but they don't do anything. I always say, hey, jump into the arena. Do something about it, because we all have tremendous power. So I said to myself, I'm going to take that power, I'm going to jump into the race, and I'm going to make changes. So it's not something that I planned early on, it's something that uh, later on became, always said, the dream of mine, and uh, a desire that jumped in there. And I can tell you, my wife was not happy about that decision at all. I mean, uh, as I wrote in my book, I mean, she freaked out that she was sitting in the jacuzzi. I remember it was like uh, two days before announcing. I mean, she's sitting in the jacuzzi and I said, Maria, what do you think about me running for governor? She started shaking and freaking out and started crying. She says, oh, I come from a political family. I know what that means. You then would never be home. It would be the destruction of the family and all of those things. But, you know, at the same time, her mother told her, I said, look, you know that in our family, the women always support the guys. And, uh, you know, Arnold has this in his stomach, he feels it. I think that we should support him. And so she was really the one that, that helped to get Maria on, on board. And then Maria, you know, jumped in 100% behind it. And then was a, a great partner. And we were campaigning up the, and down the state. And, uh, you know, and, and I won. Uh, even though there were people who said you would never win, the Democrats are going to destroy you, they're going to go and you know, bring out all the bad things that you've done in the past, and, uh, and, and you know, and they did, but I mean, they won anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I was governor for seven years and had a terrific time doing it, and, uh, you know, now I'm continuing, like I said, serving the people, but now I'm back in show business, I'm making movies, uh, a movie wow. coming out with Stallone very soon, uh, you know, The Escape Plan, and then, uh, uh, you know, we have another movie coming out in January. Uh, so this, it's, it's great work in that doing Terminator 5 and in January we start with Terminator 5. And, uh, and the twins uh, and Conan, King Conan. And so there's a, a whole bunch of uh, movies that I'm going to continue doing. Unbelievable. Well, um, all right, Legend, two prong question. This is for the, for the hardcore weightlifters out here, pretty much for all of us. Um, what's your favourite exercise and what's the heaviest you've ever bench pressed? <laughs> the heaviest ever bench pressed was 525. And uh, my favourite exercise, all of the rowing exercises and the pulling exercises were always my favourite. I loved heavy bend over rowing. Uh, I remember we were doing with 315 with the three big 45 pound plates on each side. Bend over rowing off a bench, standing on the bench and balancing on the bench because you could stretch further down. You can go and get a pull and was stretch out of the lats or the T-bar rowing. And I remember also, you know, doing uh, chin-ups with, with plates around the waist uh, was one of my favorite exercises. You stretch your, your lats out and you, you get wider shoulders and all that. So it was always uh, the, the pulling exercises. Whereas my training partner, Franco Colombo, who is a, you know, a, sh a shorter bodybuilder, but he was pound for pound the most powerful bodybuilder, uh, I think, of all times. And he was very good also with pulling exercises, but more with pressing exercises. He bench pressed uh, 540 with a body weight of 180. I mean, it was unbelievable, and he squatted at 600 pounds like nothing, uh, because he was already so low to the ground. I said, Frank, I mean, you don't, to, you don't have to go far. I mean, I have to go all the way down, and you just go boom, 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 boom. I mean, you know, it was easy. And he was deadlifting with, five, with 735, he was doing like three reps, and, and, and things like that. So he was better in pressing exercises, but I was always, uh, I felt really comfortable with pulling exercises. Uh, so, uh, but... And the key thing is in bodybuilding and in lifting that you take the exercises that you're not good at and where you're weak. Like for instance, if you a lot of bodybuilders have weak calves. So then I cut off immediately my, uh, my pants to expose my calves so that you see it all the time. So I'm embarrassed about having calves that are too small. And then I then made me train every day 15 sets because I remember when I met Reg Park, uh, and trained with him in South Africa. He was doing every day 15 sets with 500 pounds, 700 pounds, 800 pounds. He went up with the weight all the time with enormous weights. 
and every day. And so I realized that that's what you need to do is just cut off the pants, expose your weakness, and that make what makes you train rather than hiding your weakness, which a lot of bodybuilders do. Expose it and train that, that the things that you hate to do and train that every day 15, 20 sets. Then you overcome those obstacles and then you can get rid of the weak point once and for all. Well, I'm from Perth, mate. I'm from Perth, Western Australia, and it's pretty warm and it's pretty sunny, so we get to, you know, cruise around in shorts a lot. So uh, I'm always exposed, but I really like coming to Melbourne because I gotta wear jeans because it's cold, so I get to cover up with chook legs. <laughs> um, my son's five, and I thought I was going to, you know, meet Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he, you know, he's only five, and you know, he were and I showed him photos, you know, you back in the day, and he's like, oh, and he goes, and I'm, you know, every, every day it's their son's idol, and no one can beat me, and I'm the king, I'm the top king of the world. And then he saw me, your photo, and he's like, he stared at it for about five minutes, and he's always been in the garage pumping weights, you know, trying to pump weights, and he thinks he's me. And he goes, oh, dad, he's got big muscles, he's gonna <laughs> smash you. <laughs> So mate, even for you, you, you've got an impact on everyone. Before we were saying just how much presence you have. You don't meet many people, myself and a mate of mine were talking before, and there's not many people that you meet in your life that have such presence that you do. It's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. You know, you've got a, like, a bit of an aura about you, man. You just do, you know, I just want to give you a big hug and say you're <laughs> um, two, two, two questions, if, if, if we can, from the crowd quickly, but obviously sensible questions, and uh, you know, obviously uh, with all respect to, to to the boss. Bodybuilding Championships in Columbus, Ohio every year. That has become now the biggest competition in the world and also the biggest fitness and sports festival over a period of three uh, days and then we have approximately 20,000 participants and we have approximately 200,000 people coming through their spectators. So it's really a gigantic event and so eventually we decided a few years ago to uh, expand and to take it to all the different continents not just have it in North America. So we started in Europe, in Spain, in Madrid, and there we have it now for the last two years. We had a success for Arnold's Classic there, and it has, in the second year, it has doubled the size over the first year. This year we had it for the first time in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and it was a huge smash. We had to turn tens of, tens of thousands of people away. That's how successful it was. Now we're gonna go to Asia, to China, and also expand to China, but one of the places, of course, because I love uh, Australia, is that we're going to also have it, which is another continent, a very important continent, we have it also in Australia. So yes, I have to talk to Paul Graham and to other people, promoters, uh, to come together and to have a very successful Arnold's Classic uh, in 2014 or 2015 uh, for the first time here in Australia. So yes, we are expanding and this is part of my uh, fitness crusade and I just want to tell you that I am so excited about our fitness crusade because 45 years ago when I started this stuff, before you were born, uh, <laughs> uh, we, I, I said that one day we are going to have gymnasiums everywhere. And at that point there were no gymnasiums anywhere except in some dungeons. And people said if you work out with weights, you're going to get muscle bound. And you're going to get stupid. You become a narcissist, you're going to turn gay with all the kind of the crazy things that they came up with. And now, 45 years later, the crusade has been so successful that now there literally is a gymnasium in every single hotel all over the world. In every military base, every police station, every fire station, every university, every high school, every university, everywhere there are gymnasiums. There's weight training at home. I mean, the equipment business is booming. The magazine business in this core industry is booming. The food supplement business is booming. It is unbelievable what is happening. And so we're going to continue with the crusade. And I'm very happy that now everyone recognizes, especially athletes, that weight training is absolutely essential to 
But even if you're a golfer or a tennis player, or if you're a boxer or whatever, everyone is using weights. Everyone has to use it, of course, in a different way. Not like a bodybuilder, but different ways. But weight resistance training is very important. So I'm very excited about how great the, the move is going and the crusade is going in uh, weight resistance training and bodybuilding and fitness and all of this. And I'm very excited to be uh, right in the middle of the action. Thank you. Sorry guys, I have to cut that one short, but Marty, just uh, in closing mate, what do you, uh, when you talk about, and we really have for yourself to thank for the reason we're here today, and this whole gym's here, and this whole industry, the whole fitness industry itself, owes you, uh, you know, uh, a lot mate. Um, what do you think of Dick's gym here at Derriman? Well, I think that even though I had a big vision of where the gymnasium business is going, but I did not envision that it ever would get that big. I mean, uh, this is like a, a truly like a body factory, and uh, it is a wonderful atmosphere. I love the space, the size, the amount of members that he has, and the, the way he promotes it. I mean, he runs it like a real business, and he also makes the business and the fitness affordable, which is the most important thing. We got to make uh, uh, the, the, the whole fitness and the weight training accessible to anyone and everyone. No matter what kind of a job you have or what age you're in, you should be able to come to the gymnasium and you should be able to train. And that's what he does. And so I, I think that this has been, this is a great, great gymnasium. I'm happy that I came here today and to give the speech here and to, to answer questions and all this. And I also want to say thank you very much to you for being here today. You've been a great champion and have made great, great contributions and entertaining people through great, great fights. So thank you very much. You've been good to get out. Today it is my pleasure to present Mr. Schwarzenegger with a certificate that represents the key to our great city. This token is presented in recognition of your great achievement as an outstanding politician, as the former governor of California, world champion athlete and bodybuilder, record-breaking box office actor, entrepreneur and ph philanthropist. Thank you very much.